All right. I was hoping that, you know, I'm, yeah, well, I, I wanted to go last, but, uh, but the, the, the idea was to have as many people uh, join in as, uh, as are going to. But, uh, but yeah, so the name is Omer Shahid, and um, I started working with Postgres and the Postgres community in 2003, and uh, it was an accidental push into open source, uh, nothing, nothing very, you know, conscious. But uh, I have been working with Postgres uh, ever since. Uh, my day job and my uh, volunteer effort uh, has all been uh, around Postgres and the Postgres community. Um, at the moment, I am running an organization by the name of Stromatics, uh, which is also an EDB partner, by the way. And we provide professional services uh, that is focused on Postgres. And uh, I, I actually have a light slide deck that is meant to introduce Postgres to folks, especially that are coming from the Oracle world. And it feels like this might be a good audience for it because, uh, you know, an intro to Postgres, uh, it, it, it sounds like uh, some of the folks are new to Postgres. Let me just uh, share the screen and walk you through a few slides. Can somebody confirm that you see this? Yes. All right, excellent. So, so again, yeah. um, now I titled this using open source safely for critical data primarily because one of the most frequently uh, um, shared objections that I faced with using Postgres is that, well, it's open source, it's not safe, and you know how can we rely on it, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I just wanted to bust uh, a few myths uh, regarding uh, open source in, in general and Postgres in particular. Um, I've already introduced myself. Um, I'm talking to you right now all the way from uh, Islamabad. And uh, over the past 20 odd years, I've been uh, with EDB Open FCG, Second Quadrant at Percona, all pure play Postgres companies. And uh, currently, uh, I'm, you know, as I said, I'm running Stromatics. Uh, with a mission to help businesses scale Postgres uh, reliably for critical data. Again, the key word over here is critical data. Uh, yes, the topic at hand. So, what is Postgres? Um, you know, uh, all of you over here already know it, but uh, I, I still feel that uh, at times it is valuable to go back to the roots and understand what exactly is Postgres and where it stands in the technology stack and the tech world. It's an object relational database, not just a relational database, an object relational database, much like Oracle is, or much like SQL Server is, um, but very different from both Oracle and SQL Server, it is open source with a very liberal license. Um, and the liberal license is important over here because open source also comes in many flavors. Uh, some licenses are more restrictive than others. Uh, with the Postgres license, it's pretty much as liberal as it gets. It allows you to do whatever you want to do with it. Uh, we can talk about, uh, you know, a more about it. I've actually given uh, entire talks on just the license, but um, you know, just know that it, it it allows you to do whatever you want to do. It's compliant with the SQL standard. Uh, asset compliance is kind of like you know taken for granted when you're working with databases. Um, if it's not asset compliant, it's not a database. Um, it handles both structured as well as unstructured data. And another unique thing about Postgres, something that you don't really find in other databases, it's how extensible it is. Uh, it provides hooks that you can uh, write APIs for, and uh, you can write extensions and uh, add functionality to the database. And um, a bit of a history lesson uh, about the database. Uh, it's not something that just came into existence. It's uh, not something new. It started off in 1986 in the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, at that time, the name was uh, the Berkeley Postgres Project and was led by Michael Stonebreaker um, and was sponsored by a bunch of uh, US defense organizations. Um, about eight years, um, after its initial start, um, it found its way, uh, its way into open source and into, into the open world 
the code was made available for the for, for everybody to to see and use, um, and the SQL interpreter was was added. Now, this time span of eight years, nineteen eighty six to nineteen ninety four, is also around the time when um, Sybase was uh, originated in the same university uh, with a lot of a team that overlapped. So it was the University of California, Berkeley, around the same time frame. And Microsoft SQL Server actually took its roots from Sybase. So if you, if you go into the architecture of how the database is structured, you will find a lot of similarities between Postgres and SQL Server. And uh, you can trace back the roots of those similarities uh, to the University of California, Berkeley, where they both originated from. Um, in 1996, um, folks decided that Postgres 95 is a name that cannot scale, that every year uh, the year number is going to change. So they just removed the 95, uh, a nod to the SQL interpreter that was added and began to call the database PostgreSQL, which is what it's called to this day, or Postgres for short. Um, this is a snapshot from um, uh, the Postgres website. Um, I think some of these numbers are a little outdated. Uh, it, the, the numbers are bigger now, but um, uh, just, just to show that it's, it's a thriving community that's very global in nature. Uh, lots of users that are happily using Postgres for their critical data um, and uh, lots of contributors around the world. Now, this slide right here um, is, you know, one of my favorite graphs uh, that I tend to show in in, in various presentations. <clears throat> uh, essentially, uh, what I've done is um, I've taken the top five databases as per DB Engines. DB Engines is a um, is an authority on the database subject matter, and um, Stack Overflow is perhaps the biggest collective of um, technology developers uh, in the world. And uh, both these um, authorities uh, run surveys and publish uh, their survey results uh, every year. DB Engines essentially does a database of the year uh, award and Stack Overflow publishes a developer survey each year. And what I did was I picked up the top five databases as per DB Engines and I traced over the past five years, the popularity of each of those databases as per Stack Overflow survey. Now, you, you see over here that um, amongst developers, Oracle is not a very popular database. It, 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 it's not a popular database today, and it was never a, a very popular database. Now, Postgres, was not the most popular database when, you know, five years ago, MySQL was, but over the course of this time, Postgres has risen in popularity and gained the top position. 2023 was the first year when it came out on top uh, above every other database, and 2024, uh, it has just increased the lead. Uh, and also interesting is that Postgres is the only database that is consistently rising in popularity over the past five years. And the implication of this is that um, if, if developers are choosing Postgres to write their applications, increasingly um, you know, over the next years, you will find more and more instances of Postgres being pushed into production uh, and requiring specialized expertise uh, to be able to scale uh, in production. Um, and it's not just about Postgres. Um, open source in general is exploding. Um, you know, this, this survey right here uh, talks about a 16.2% 16, 16 compound annual growth rate of uh, open source software usage between 2022 and 2027. Um, Red Hat's uh, survey once published this, this code that you know it's no longer about whether you want to adopt uh, open source technologies. Uh, the question now is when and how. So it, it's kind of like a no brainer. And uh, there are increasing levels of trust uh, in, in open source software with 89% of ID leaders believing that uh, open source 
is more secure than proprietary software. 80% um, of IT le uh, leaders expect to increase the use of open source technologies in their production environments. Uh, and 77% of IT leaders have a more positive impression of open source technologies than they did uh, the previous year. These are surveys you know, uh, conducted by Red Hat uh, and, and published. And also, you know, when I started working with Postgres in 2003, uh, it was almost all about cost. Uh, it was almost all about uh, trying to save on expense, uh, but increasingly, uh, and you know, if, if you if you look at this survey right here, um, the top reason why somebody would use open source is for better security, and the second highest reason uh, is for better quality of software. Uh, cost is no longer in the equation, uh, at least not in the top four. Now, even though it's not. Uh, part of the equation anymore, you know, people are not moving to open source just for cost, which is a tremendous factor. Now, this table right here is comparing the cost, the list price of um, Oracle licenses, uh, if you want to use them in production, uh, if you want to use the database in production and comparing it with uh, uh, the, the typical pri price post you would pay for Postgres. Now, with Oracle, one of the things that uh, that really catches you is that it's not just about the database engine, the database server. Um, every extended piece of functionality that you want to implement, uh, you need to pay extra for it. Um, so any any database in production uh, will need reliability, uh, clustering, high availability, disaster recovery, security, uh, and support. And uh, Oracle charges you separately for every everything that you add on. And it adds up to a staggering $107,450 per socket per year for the enterprise edition. Um, and compared to that, all of that functionality you can get with Postgres at only $5,000 a year. Now, these are indicative figures. Uh, it can be slightly lower. It can be slightly higher. Uh, but roughly speaking, if you're comparing Postgres against Oracle, the relative ratios are going to remain the same. So, um, and the, the the natural question that I get each time I talk about cost is that, well, you get what you pay for. So if you're paying that little, you're probably compromising on, on features. And that's a myth that I want to bust uh, over here. Now, the left column or right here is features that you would expect from any database worth its salt. So any database has to be reliable, it has to be scalable, it needs to perform, it has to be secure. So, and, and, and Postgres provides you all of those things, but this is you know, not that big of a deal. This is taken for granted. You, you need to have these features. What makes our, uh, Postgres stand apart is the column on the right side. Um, extensibility is something that comes unique to Postgres. You can, you know, there, there's a uh, huge ecosystem of extensions that uh, that you can not only uh, use, but you can also write your own extensions uh, if you need any functionality that you cannot find. There's uh, there's a thriving open source community uh, that is there for help and uh, development of the database. Uh, you get support. Uh, from different vendors without any lock-in, uh, SLA-based support that you can rely on. If you don't like a particular vendor, you can just pick up uh, the, support, the, the the same software, the same setup, the same everything, and go to a different vendor, and you know um, they can start supporting you. So there's no no lock-in over there. Um, and of course, it's not just about you know the, the compliance of the standards is there. Uh, Postgres is as compliant, and it's it's compliant with the with the SQL standard. But our community is also a thought leader in developing the SQL standard. The standard that came out for 2024, uh, some of the core team members of the Postgres community were actively part of it. In fact, the introduction of uh, a graph SQL uh, in the SQL standard was made by the Postgres community. So we're, we're thought leaders in the standard as well. And what that has resulted in is a plethora of um, uh, and a, a huge ecosystem of tools and extensions and utilities uh, that uh, you know you can find 
in uh, and uh, no matter uh, what it is that uh, you're trying to achieve uh, with the database, you will be able to find some tool uh, or some extension or uh, you know uh, some fork that implements it. So you know whether it's graph database, whether you're talking about spatial data, uh, whether it's uh, you know AI, uh, you will find something in there, and uh, you can host all of these workloads uh, in Postgres. Um, and lots of global brands um, using Postgres reliably in production. Um, and um, the interesting thing about this screen right here is that uh, these are not brands that I've pulled off of the internet. Uh, these are names that I have personally worked with over the course of the past two decades. So I'm not, I'm not taking input from somebody else and you know, taking their word for it. Uh, these are organizations that I have personally uh, helped in some shape or form uh, use Postgres so I know uh, that they are using uh, it reliably in production. Um, and that actually, you know, is um, um, pretty much the, the the end of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, and again, you know, the the, the idea uh, was to just give an introduction uh, about the database and uh, make sure that uh, we we understand where Postgres is coming from. We understand that uh, um, uh, you know it, it's a reliable database that you can use in production. Um, and that uh, open source is something that uh, needs to be embraced. That's the next uh, big wave that's hitting uh, the tech sector. Um, and uh, you know we, we're now trying to build a community uh, for folks, especially in Riyadh, uh, who, who want to embrace these technologies and uh, might need some help with Postgres. So that was the end of my monologue. <laughs> Any um, any uh, questions or comments from anybody? So uh, I have just uh, one question regarding the Postgres, as you mentioned, uh, the, com the comparison uh, table you have shared uh, between Oracle and Postgres SQL. One yeah. of the major uh, thing you highlighted is uh, in terms of dollar. If someone wants to uh, purchase standard and or enterprise edition of Oracle, they need to pay a lot of dollars. But on the other side, uh, Postgres is totally free. You just pay. You just need to pay uh, five thousand dollars for the upgradation and support. If you for, want for support, those, yeah. If you want support for those companies, um, uh, where money not matter. So why they come on, on Postgres instead of uh, the Oracle? Like I, I'm a company where money is now not a matter for me. So what's, uh, what's the main uh, point to convince uh, that company, hey, you still require Postgres SQL instead of Oracle? So first off, if you're an organization that you know money doesn't matter to you, I don't even want to talk to you. <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, for everything else, well, you know, here are four reasons why you would want uh, to use Postgres uh, that are, you know, not about cost. So even if money doesn't matter to you, you are getting better security, you are getting higher quality software, you are able to leverage uh, the open source technology better and you are able to uh, work in the cloud and design cloud native applications. So it's not just about, uh, not just about cost saving, right? Um, also, uh, there was another slide that I shared. Here you go. So the right side uh, column over here, extensibility, community, vendor support, and compliance. Uh, these, are, these are areas that are unique to Postgres, right? Uh, the, 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 you know, you, you don't find uh, extensions or ecosystem of extensions, or you cannot develop extensions for Oracle. Uh, you don't have a community of uh, open source enthusiasts contributing to Oracle. Um, Oracle is the only organization that can um, um, support uh, their database. Uh, and, you know, once you um, start using Oracle, you're locked into uh, that vendor. 
Um, and uh, well, you know, there are, um, and, and, and not through any fault of their own, but um, Oracle is not fully SQL standard compliant. It's, um, uh, it's you know, uh, they, they, they started working on the database before the SQL standard was a thing. And uh, they just stuck to uh, what, uh, what what they were, but the rest of the world moved in a different direction, um, and uh, that the compliance factor uh, is not there. So there, there there are a variety of reasons why somebody would uh, could could choose Postgres uh, over Oracle, uh, if even if uh, cost is not a factor to them. Mm -hmm. okay. Hope that helps, uh, Moose. I know that you had raised your hand. Yes, Omar, I just wanted to add to, to, to point number four, which um, what the one, two, three, four, which is the reasons why to use Postgres. I just wanted to add the, the term versatility because Postgres, we all know it's open source and you can download it and use it anywhere. But even if you get support from, from any of the Postgres companies out there, it's the versatility of deployment. Today, you're deploying on VMs. Tomorrow, you're going to public cloud. After, you're going to private cloud, on-prem, on-cloud. Uh, even even now with with our with the Kubernetes, it's not an offering, but with the Kubernetes, with the operator and the containerized database, you have the versatility to be changing all of this anytime that you want. Even if you're getting support from someone, you're not locked in into any type of deployment. With other companies, you have to go back to that company. Hey, can I migrate? Do I have the licenses? Can we do this? Can we do that? It's a hassle. But with Postgres and any company that supports you, whatever deployment you have today. You can always move it. It's better to go back to your company so they give you best practices, but no one is going to lock you in. It's like, oh, no, you have license for VMs. You cannot go on Kubernetes or OpenShift tomorrow. No, no, you can. Now, this is one of the best reasons is, is you don't have the headache. Oh, do I have to go back to that company? That does not exist with Postgres. Yep. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. All right. Anybody else has anything? Okay, I guess not. Um, any folks, you know, I, I want um, I want to build. Uh, so, so this 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 uh, was meant to be a session for uh, the Riyadh Postgres user group. Uh, the Postgres global community has. Uh, um, officially recognized the user group and listed it on the Postgres website as well. And uh, I, I want to try and drive this this community building. Um, I, I want to work together whoever with whoever wants to uh, be a part of this and uh, really drive the the community and build it. Um, I'd, I'd like to get you know hear ideas uh, from um, from you guys to you know on on what we can do to build the community and encourage. Uh, more participation. Anybody who has any ideas, anything, any anybody who has any suggestions. Excuse me. Um, Omer, I think uh, would you be able to highlight what what the user group is? That it's it's not it's not us, the companies coming to pitch in. You know, these are not sessions to pitch us a certain product or a certain service. It's about the community, building the community and the Q&A between us. Because I think some of the folks who are joining for the first time, they think this is the, the, this is like a, a professor student kind of thing. Well, it's it's really not. And, and at the beginning of the call, you're asking people to introduce each other. And, and if you can explain the sense of the community and what it's for, I think people will be more comfortable to, to jump in and join with us. Uh, no, excellent point. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think being being a part of the community uh, sometimes puts blinders on, and uh, I, I tend to assume stuff that I shouldn't assume. Right. So, uh, so yeah, no, uh, I, I think it's a very fair point, and uh, uh, thank you for elaborating and thank you for bringing that up. The the so the the, the way this happens is in in one of the slides uh, I shared that there are uh, various local user groups uh, across the world for Postgres. Now. Um, Postgres being an open source project essentially is driven by enthusiasts of the project, enthusiasts of the technology who volunteer their time and put in the effort to make sure that it continues moving forward and continues thriving and, and pushing forward. And as part of that effort, there are uh, user groups that are created 
in different parts of the world, in different cities of the world. Um, and the idea is to bring uh, enthusiasts and passionate people together on a single platform so we can meet each other and talk to each other and exchange ideas. Now, this is all about open source. This is all about the community. This is all about the project. There is no commercial angle to it. Um, and uh, you know, um, it, it it is open for anybody and everybody to contribute and uh, talk to and exchange ideas and put up suggestions. So, so yeah, um, I, I also uh, do do understand that uh, it's uh, you know when, when you're new to it, the concept of how the open source communities work. Uh, is a little alien to understand and hard to digest, but over time, you, when you get used to it, uh, it's hard to imagine any other way uh, any project could survive. So, uh, so yeah. So, so you know, uh, again, Moose, thanks, thanks for pointing this out. But yeah, the idea is to be collaborative. The idea is to be inclusive um, and to have discussions um, and uh, to, to you know to put our hands together and uh, make the community grow. Okay, let's be silence. That's fine. <laughs> Annie, you yeah, have yeah, your hand up. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, knowledge sharing is the objective for these sessions. I knowledge think. sharing, for sure. Um, also, exchange of ideas, right? It, it's recommendations and suggestions and helping each other out. Um, it's, you know, I, I was the one who shared some of my knowledge mostly today. But, uh, you know, in the next session, I could be the person who's saying, hey, I have this problem. Can somebody help solve this problem? Right. Whatever that problem is. I, mean, I don't know. Uh, but uh, so, so, you know, uh, this, this is a platform where people can come, uh, come and put up their problems and ask for help, um, share their knowledge, uh, share interesting stories that they might, uh, you know, have experienced uh, with, uh, with clients. Uh, share interesting use cases, Postgres, pretty much anything, open forum. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, definitely, uh, uh, Umad, uh, this is an, um, a, a really very good opportunity uh, to us to discuss with our problems and uh, to gain the knowledge of Postgres SQL. Definitely, the Postgres SQL community is very bigger. Uh, there are some mailing threads on the Postgres SQL, and people can go, they put their... Uh, uh, the queries on the mailing thread and community is very, very active. But the problem with this bigger group is, uh, the, uh, I think so, um, the closeness of the um, um, uh, uh, peoples. I think so that's uh, when we join as a smaller group of uh, post-case community, that will help us to understand the exact case study uh, and and to try to resolve the problems uh, in a private way. So I think so. These types of uh, uh, small communities within a post case is really helpful uh, to to get uh, your uh, problems answered. Uh, I think so. That's uh, that's a more uh, uh, good uh, opportunity that you are providing uh, on <coughs> this forum. And then the next sure. question: how, how how we can uh, grow this community? Uh, definitely, your, uh, your Zoom sections are really very uh, uh, important for the growth perspective. Uh, like if we if we go ge geographically in different regions, like uh, in Middle East, so definitely the Middle East people can uh, guide us okay, how we can uh, grow this community in Middle East as well. In European countries, in America, in and other, I think so. Uh, that is very well known on the open source. Uh, but I'm not sure about the Middle East and the other one. Definitely, there are some people from the Middle East. They can guide us to how we can uh, improve our community appearance in, in that area. Yeah, now there, there, there is a user group already operational in Dubai. Um, mm -hmm. the, Riyadh, this is, this is a new one. I don't think there's anything, any, any other user group in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so, so the Riyadh is, is the first one. Um, I know in the Middle East, there is a user group in uh, Israel. Uh, I am not sure if Turkey will be included in the Middle East or, or where, but I know that there's a user group in, in Turkey as well. 
So, uh, but but yeah, they, they, you know, they, 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 there are user groups uh, in uh, in the region, but for Saudi Arabia, this is the first one. Anyways, all right. Uh, I guess you know we can we can uh, close the session and uh, the LinkedIn group uh, that uh, hosts the the, the Riyadh Postgres user group. We will continue interacting over there. Again, that that group is open for anybody to post in and and to interact. So feel free. To, to do so, um, encourage people uh, who are interested interested in Postgres, especially in Riyadh and interested in Postgres, uh, to join the group and uh, you know be a part of the community. Uh, let let's figure out how to um, uh, how to come up with the next session and um, how to conduct the next session and what what the the topic of conversation might be. And uh, let let's continue working on this. All right. Okay, so um, I will thank everybody for, for, for joining in. Wish everybody a great evening ahead. I don't think there's a lot of time zones involved, so it is evening for everybody. And uh, we will see each other soon. Thank you so much, Omar. Thank you, thank everyone, you. for care. joining. And bye. Thank you, bye. everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.